already starting already. Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. Uh, my name is Tim and I'll just be introducing real brief while Brown is collecting money. I'd like to welcome all of you to the college tonight. Just as a brief reminder, this will be taped for posterity purposes on YouTube for eventual distribution to the internet. And I'd like to remind everybody about two college rules. One is uh, one fool at a time. The second rule is no personal attacks. The College of Complexes format consists of uh, a brief announcement period, then our speaker speaks, followed by a question and answer period, then followed by our infamous rebuttal period. I would now like to get the parade of announcements started and move on. And the first one, let's get right up and we'll get started. Thank you. Is uh, Ishan uh, is Isan uh, Ta here? Ta here? Ta here. All right. Well, the accent should be on the right <laughs> syllable. All right. And uh, she uh, will be speaking about the Zakat Foundation of America, which is a U.S. based Muslim run charity organization. And it shows the beauty of Islam uh, through programs reaching the destitute of all faiths, at home and abroad, using zakat and sadaka. I hope I'm pronouncing perfect. 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 Uh, donations. I, I mean, Muslims are supposed to uh, uh, give alms uh, and do good at distribute. Uh, uh, they. Uh, the uh, ZF, uh, the Zakat Foundation, develops long-term sustainable solutions to the roots of poverty. Is that correct? All right. And First, to introduce myself, I'd like to go over a brief bio of my name. Um, my name is Arabic. Uh, it's Ehsan, the correct, correct pronunciation. Ehsan, like Hebrew, it's a hard, hard pronunciation. Um, it means goodness. So my mom had an idea that she would give me and all my sister's names that we would eventually live up to. I try to be a good girl sometimes. Okay? So, pretty much, um, I work as a CAD foundation. I've been there about four years at this point. Uh, by profession, I'm a registered nurse. Um, I specialize in emergency, uh, emergency and trauma medicine, um, and I'm a health organizer there. Uh, my real passion lies with organizing. Um, I do like hospitals, but I really don't like being in them all the time, which is why I decided to kind of branch off into nonprofit work. One question that a lot of people ask whenever we're at, whenever we're at um, bazaars, whenever we're at events and expos and things like that. Whenever we're at expos, people always come by and they always ask, what is zakat? What does zakat mean for us as Muslims, okay? Um, and I couldn't think of a better time to talk about this because right now we're celebrating the holy month of Ramadan where we are fasting from sunrise to sunset. And uh, during this month, we give a lot of zakat. So pretty much the best definition of zakat that I have is, you know, one of the most important, it's one of the most important principles of Islam. Um, pretty much the idea is that everything belongs to God. So as people, we're supposed to give to those who don't have. So it's usually, it's certain regulations as far as giving zakat. Typically it's 2.5% of your income that's been sitting at a bank for more than a year. So at the end of the year, people will deduct that amount and give it to zakat, okay? The word zakat does mean pur purification and growth, um, which is an essential component of a zakat. So pretty much what our mission is, uh, we foster charitable giving to alleviate the immediate needs of the poor communities and to establish long-term, I stress, sustainable, sustainable development projects that ensure individual and community growth. We do this, we do this both here in the U.S. and we do it abroad as well. Okay, this is just a brief um, highlight of the programs that we have. We work in over 40 countries all across the world. 
like I said, the U.S. Um, we work in Ghana, we work in West Africa, East Africa, subcontinent, uh, we work in parts of Europe as well. Um, and I mean, pretty much our work is just spread out. A ton of different projects, a ton of different work. I, what my job with the organization is, I work primarily in the U.S. and with our U.S. health initiatives. So pretty much our organization is broken down into a couple of different categories of programs, okay? We are a Muslim run charity organization, like I said, but this does not limit our work to Muslims only. We have a very universal approach. Anyone who needs help, that's who we help. So emergency relief. Uh, we've been in Syria for a very long time. That's one of our very strong projects at the moment because of the crisis going on there. Uh, we have a la large and extensive orphan sponsorship program too. Um, development, like I said, sustainability is a huge component of our organization. Sadaqa Jadia, um, which is pretty much just a fancy word for perpetual charity. And when I say perpetual charity, I'm referring to not someone giving a couple dollars and then ending it right there. I'm referring to the wells that we build. That's perpetual charity. Those wells last years and years and years. Someone giving money to build a school. The school lasts years and years and years. So, you know, Sadaqa Jariya is also a big component of Islam as well. We have a huge well project. One year, 100 wells. The goal in 2012 was to build 100 wells all across the world. And I had the opportunity to actually go and help with a well in Ghana. Um, last, no, two months ago. Um, so it's like, it's the idea of giving a gift that gives consistently, okay? We have seasonal programs and we also have U.S. programs that I'll eventually expand on. All right, so with our emergency relief, both from natural and man-made disasters, um, we provide supplies such as food, water, health care, hygiene packages, clothing, medicine, you name it, <coughs> do it. Um, countries that we've served within the last year, Libya, Syria, Somalia, Kenya, Uganda, and Pakistan. Okay. Emergency relief again, like I said, one of our projects that is ongoing now is the Syrian crisis. Um, we have several clinics, um, several hospitals that we've sponsored over in certain parts of Syria, um, food distributions, things like that. Um, there's a lot of internally displaced people. So we've built houses, we've, you know, supplied people with the supplies to, you know, build places where they can live. Okay? Am I going too fast or no? No. Okay, great. Okay. So our orphan sponsorship program, pretty popular um, program that we have with the organization um, because Pretty much it's a dollar a day. So 30 bucks a month, um, you provide food, clothing, education, and access to healthcare for orphans. Um, these right here, these are orphans in subcontinent India that we have sponsored. Um, as far as orphan as far as orphanages, um, we have located in Bangladesh, which I've actually visited, um, Ghana, Lebanon, Palestine, uh, Sri Lanka, and Syria. So we actually have orphanages there. Um, roughly between each orphanage, we have about 40 kids. Okay. Development is also, like I said, a huge component of our work. Um, our projects, we strive to provide long-term um, solutions for communities around the world. Um, this is some of the work that we've done in Europe. Um, you know, giving, for instance, a sewing school. We've had a sewing school in West Africa. We teach the girls how to sew. You know, you give them the tools, and then they, they go from there, right? So you're teaching them all these skills with the hopes that they'll, you know, they'll, once you leave, they'll still be able to use them, okay? Like I had mentioned, Sadaqa Jadia, uh, like I said, it's equivalent to the concept of perpetual charity. Um, you know, you receive a reward for all those who benefit from this project. Um, like I said, that includes wells, mosques, and schools. Okay, and those are two pictures actually. One is of a school, the one up right there, that's one of our schools, and that's actually um, one of our schools in West Africa. Uh, again, this is the, what I talked about earlier, the One Year 100 Wells Project, uh, which was our campaign in 2012. Uh, most of the wells we built were in West Africa due to the water shortage there. Okay. And actually, one interesting thing that a lot of people do is, for instance, um, somebody passes away. Muslims, we do this a lot. Um, for instance, if somebody, if one of my parents was to pass away, right, it's my responsibility to consistently give charity on their behalf. So what people will do is they'll call us and they'll be like, listen, my dad just died. I need a well built in his name. So, you know, they'll give us the money. We'll build a well in honor of his or, you know, his or her father, okay? okay. Healthcare. This is my, my thing as an organization, okay? Um, our healthcare programs focus both on preventative and responsive healthcare. 
So here in the U.S., uh, we do health screenings. Um, so it's preventative health care. We do uh, lipid panels out of our community center. We do blood pressures and diabetic diabetes checks. Um, we partner up with local hospitals to make sure that patients have referrals to doctors if they're underinsured or they don't have any insurance at all. Uh, we actually have a community fair coming up. Uh, we also, we're going to partner with the Department of Public Health, and uh, people are gonna, kids are going to get their immunizations done and all that stuff. Okay. Uh, seasonal programs, this is our OTIA and our Kurbani program. Pretty much that, that's just the distribution of meat um, that we do. We have two holidays that we celebrate in Islam. Uh, one of them is Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. Uh, Eid al-Fitr is the one that we celebrate after we fast. That's the big celebration that we have. The second one that we celebrate, um, we pretty much we feed people. The point of the holidays is to feed people. So we package meat and we give them to families who don't have you know, enough money to actually have a meal with meat in it, if they like meat. Thank you. Uh, again, Ramadan, um, this is one of our busiest times of the year, this month. Uh, you know, it's a month of giving. Um, people are trying to increase their good deeds. So they give through acts of service, or they give through money, you know, or they give their time to our organization, you know, hoping to reap the benefits of this blessed month. Okay, so we work in over 40 countries. We have Ramadan programs in over 40 countries. So needless to say, this is a very, 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 very busy time for us. Similar to Christmas time. Christmas time with most, you know, companies and things like that. Okay. Now, this is a project that we actually just started recently. Um, Students for Humanity. I did not spell humanity wrong. That's how we spell it for the program. So a couple of us younger folks at the organization, we were trying to come up with an idea of how to get young people motivated, young people involved with the idea of giving, uh, with the idea of giving back to their communities, okay? Um, so we came up with an idea that we would have kind of a party. Muslims do have parties, yes, we do, we do. Okay, so we had a concert that we had put on, um, and the idea was to bring about cultural awareness at the same time promoting some of the projects that we do, right? Uh, and the idea was at the end of the concert was to get students interested in doing student service trips. Student service trips to the countries that we work in. We chose Ghana because we do a lot of work in Ghana. Um, so we took about 10 kids, 10 girls actually. There's a picture of everybody. I'm all the way on the corner. Um, 16 to 24 years old, uh, mostly undergrad college students, a couple high school students, things like that. And uh, we visited Akira, Kumasi, and Sonyani. Uh, the projects included cultural exchanges, cultural programs, um, well digging, cassava farming. We have a cassava farm uh, that the organization sponsors in Sonyani. Okay. These are just some pictures. Uh, it's pictures of the students actually farming with some of our local workers there. Uh, Where is that? This is in Ghana. In Ghana. This is in Ghana yeah. And then this is actually, uh, we dug a well there. One of our workers, her sister... Can you use the mic, please? One of um, our workers, her sister, had actually passed, and um, she wanted a well dug in her honor. So, so it was, um, you know, it was a, it was a very, very heartfelt. It was a very good trip. Opened a lot of the students' eyes, you know, to people and how people are living in other countries. You know, so this is an idea that we hope to continue. We're going to do every year. Uh, we're going to continue to do Ghana, but we hope to add on other countries in the next year or so. There's just some more pictures. Um, it's a mosque that we sponsor in Ghana, and uh, one of the students speaking with one of the community elders at a fair that we actually put on for the kids here. So, on to our USA programs. Um, you know, we value doing work overseas, okay, but we also value doing work here. I think that's very important. Um, our US programs seek to educate and empower marginalized communities through access to resources not provided through the government while also serving communities in a positive way, okay? Uh, we have several offices in the US. Um, I work at the office in, on, in the South Shore region, 75th and Stoney, okay, near 75th and Stoney. We also have an office in Bridgeview and we have an office in Wilmington, Delaware. That's our East Coast Community Service Office. Okay. So, the values that we use at our center, similar to the values that we use at our corporate office, but slightly different because we're working with different communities. Seeds, safety, education, empowerment, development, and sustainability. All right? Those are all very important components at our community centers here in the U.S. Okay. Uh, also, this is a picture of uh, one of our community centers, one of the community gardens that we have. Uh, 
of, you know, being in an area where there are a lot of food deserts, where there's no access to fresh food, you know, where people have to walk blocks and blocks and blocks to get a salad or to get, a, you know, a silly apple. You know, the community garden is free. People come and pick from it. We have a ton of vegetables growing in there, from, you know, eggplants, zucchini, all this stuff. Um, so that is our community garden right there. Uh, our Delaware office, they provide tutoring, ESL classes, and classes to the youth. Um, so they do a lot of stuff there on the East Coast. That's actually the first community center we had. The one in Chicago is the second one. These are just some more pictures of our community center. This is actually a food program that we have during Ramadan. Um, we feed people um, every day of the week. Uh, and, you know, people come in, ton of kids, ton of families, people who just need food. All right, so we feed roughly about, during Ramadan, I would say, about 30 to 40 people a day. Okay. All right. And that's pretty much it. You know, find us on Facebook. We're very active on social media. We have over 500,000 likes on our Facebook. So, you know, find us around Twitter as well. First question is: Can you just give us a brief history of how you got into Zagat, okay. and what, you, and, and introduce yourself a little bit more to us? Sure. Uh, well, how I got into Zagat Foundation? I've been Muslim my entire life. My mom converted uh, while she was in college. My father is um, East African. He's from Somalia, Sudan region. Uh, I grew up with the idea of giving Zagat, the idea of giving back to your community, which is why I went into nursing. You know, I wanted to get nurse. I was interested in healthcare. I never wanted to be a doctor, ever, you know. So I wanted the direct patient-to-patient -patient contact. So I was in a hospital for a couple years. I decided that wasn't enough. I felt like I was doing a day-to-day -day difference in people's lives, but long-term, I didn't feel like I was doing much of a difference. So I decided I need to go into nonprofit work. I need to go into organizing, which is what I had been doing in high school. But once I got into college, I had kind of stopped because I was busy with school. And I heard of the CAD Foundation. Um, by the work that they do. I mean, they're very well known, especially in Muslim communities um, and also within social circles too. So they were starting their U.S. health initiatives and that's when I decided that, you know, I wanted to do more work with them. Carl Schmuck. Um, in one of your uh, slides you had about uh, education for orphans, yeah. but is it, is it, are you also doing education for uh, young girls? Yes, we do. Because I, I know that's like, is that a direct conflict though? What happens if, one of the countries uh, that you have the program, is that in, in any way like a company uh, uh, providing education for girls? Any of the communities that we partner with or any of the communities that we work with, if that's an issue, we will not partner with them. You know, a majority of our um, workforce actually here in the U.S. is female-based. You know, so we do not partner with any organizations or any individuals who do not promote education of both genders. All of our orphan sponsors, all of our orphanages are both, all of our orphanages are both male and female, and the education is for both. So, did I answer your question? Hey, uh, Gene Harker. Uh, maybe you mentioned it, but I didn't hear it. I can't hear very well, can't. Uh, See very well. Okay. Are you a 501c3 yes, tax we are. deductible? Yes, we are. Thank you. Yeah, and we're also um, recognized by Trading Navigator Four Star Organization. Yes. Uh, Bob Lincoln and then Mark. Mark. Such generous uh, charity is that required by Mohammed himself? I'm sorry. Repeat the question. Such uh, generous charity is that required by Mohammed? Himself. Expand on the question. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm exactly understanding what you mean. Does Muhammad, the founder of Islam, did he say that all people, or at least all his followers, should they all be very charitable? Yes, zakat is a very important concept in Islam. I mean, it has been around for many, many, many years. My I'm asking is, was this required by Muhammad yes. himself? Yes, yes, it's required by Islam. It's mandated in Islam to give charity. And it's mandated to give to those who are undeserved. Did, did Muhammad say that everyone should be very generous? Yes, he did. He was generous Lord. himself. Yes. And it's one of the pillars of Islam, like the gentleman just said. Yeah. He was very generous himself, and as a result, we're generous. You want a different answer. I'm sorry? He wants a different answer. <laughs> Barbara? Um, there were some um, Islamic countries that, that weren't on, I just noticed, um, 
Morocco and Algeria, and then also, I, you didn't mention Iraq, and mm -hmm. I know you're in Syria, but well, is there a reason you're not in the other countries? You know, due to certain political climates, it's difficult to get into some countries, um, you know, and we've done a lot of work in countries where we, unfortunately, we've had to stop. Um, you know, because of the political climate of the country, like I said, or U.S. involvement, things like that, you know, so when you have to keep in mind when you're doing this type of work, when you're doing this type of international relief work, it's a lot of political yes sometimes, you know, and you have to be very cognizant of it. We're very transparent as an organization, you know. I mean, we were established in 2001, shortly after September 11th, not a good look for Muslims. You know, needless to say. So, you know, as a result, we are very open with our work. We're very transparent with our work. We have people, you know, who come into our organization who are frequent donors who say, I want to go to this country and I want to see what you're doing. Sure, go right ahead. You know, so, um, I mean, there's been certain reasons why we haven't been able to do certain work in certain countries. Each country is a little different, you know, but, you know, we help as many people as we can and, you know, we try our best. And I have a, another question. Yes. Could you expand on, on the, the reason that, that it's important to have wells in places where people have access to river water? Okay. Well, it's important to have wells because a lot of the time, I'll give an example. When I was in Ghana, um, we built a well, that picture that I had showed you of one of our stores that was hammering the, the sign on. Um, that was right near an area where there was a, a river, you know, and, um, you know, a lot of the people in these areas, they're using this water source for multiple reasons. You know, they're washing, they're drinking, they're washing themselves, they're drinking, they're washing their clothes, animals are defecating in the water, and it's very dirty, you know. So the whole idea of building wells is to give people, you know, a clean source of water, you know. So, I mean, that's the importance of having wells because there's a lot of cross-contamination and a lot of people are getting sick to the point that we were in Ghana and uh, a couple people were losing their sight because the water was so bad. You know, and I'm not even speaking of, um, you know, kids who are still developing, you know, who are drinking this water. You know, people get sick very often by simply drinking the water out of those rivers. So, you know, the idea of building wells, like I said, is to just give people a clean source of water. We don't realize how blessed we are with uh, Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, Joe Mayer. Um, among the values that you talked about in your uh, presentation was uh, safety. Could you elaborate on that and give some yeah. examples? Yes, um, that value is specific for our community centers, especially the one on the south side of Chicago. Um, you know, we're on the side of town where there's a lot of gun violence. You know, we have a lot of young people who come into our organization who are seeking refuge. You know, who want to be diverted from the crowds of people that they're hanging around with, who, you know, want to partake in our activities. You would be surprised how many young people, you know, who are, what, between, what, 15 and what, maybe 30, I'm 26, we're around the same age, who come in and they're like, listen, can I help? I want to help. I don't want to be out. I don't want to do this, you know? So that, that idea of safe, that value came about because of that. You know, people really just seeking a safe, safe place to be. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Uh, Orion? Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Oh, Your do I question? Get, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I'm a little late to the party, and I don't really know everything that you said before I got here. Did you get a PowerPoint? Yeah, I'll okay, look at it later. Okay. Uh, that's okay. Well, that doesn't stop me. Oh, I right. <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you. This is our question period. So if you do have uh -huh. a question for I do. her, yes. Yeah, Go ahead. she may have answered it already. Okay. But I'll answer it again. I don't mind. Green chicken. Nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to say that in this very short time, I can tell that. I mean, when, uh, it blew my mind when you just said you're how old, 26? 26, yes. I'm 29, so I get, like, the idea of being in the 20s. But, like, to hear someone speak with such deep, calm understanding about what they do when they're in their 20s, and, I mean, that just seems like you're way ahead of your <coughs> years, you know? <laughs> and I think that's amazing. Thank you. And now the question. What is yeah, the question? And now the question, so that's the statement, and now the question is, so it was, it was recent, my eyes were recently opened to the meaning of some Muslim names. Mm -hmm. And I've always, you know, heard names like Abdul and Rashid. Very common. Yeah, but someone 
revealed to me that they have to go together. You can't be Abdul alone. Well, I guess you could be Abdul alone, but you can't be Rashid alone. Because Abdul means slave, mm -hmm. and Rashid is like one of the names of God. Mm -hmm. And so you can't just say, my name is Rashid, because then you'd be like saying, I'm God. You have to say Abdul Rashid, which means slave to God. And Rashid is what I heard. I know you know all this, but I'm letting everyone know what I just learned from someone at, at my own job. Um, he Sir, excuse me, you really do have to ask a question. <laughs> oh, okay. This is Sorry. I actually, I Here's know many Rashids. I know many Abduls. The thing is, oh. is the name can be used to answer a quick question. Um, there, the difference is we have 99 names of Allah. Of That's God. what I've heard. Why not 100? I'm curious. I, that's a question I don't know. Okay. I don't know. But with, with that being said, um, it's okay to use the names by themselves. You know, everything oh. goes back to your intention. Rashid is not a name of Allah. That, it's not a name. That's just oh. a, it's just a verb. You know. So, oh, it is. It is. It's yeah. A verb. So, so you, you can be Abdul or you can be Rashid. Um, you know. So I mean, I know many. So like I said. my question. I'll cut to the chase. My question is just. Yes. Sorry, everybody. Okay. My question is. Um, Uh, how, how would you characterize the experience of being a slave to God? Oh, wow, that's an in-depth question. I, is that an appropriate question to answer here? You, it, maybe, it, maybe he had it's, 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 an op, it's an open It's an open forum, so it's your choice whether to answer it or not. Okay. Can please answer just because I, I mean, would love to know. <laughs> I mean, being a slave to God, I, that's not an issue for me, you know. I mean, being a slave to something that's good, I, I don't see a problem with that. Right, essentially. I agree. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, uh, one of the things you can explain right. to this gentleman that uh -huh. you can express all that in the end we give you five or ten minutes depending on how many people want to so you can express yeah, all those ideas. All right. Comment period. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's an yes. amazing process. <laughs> we are all nuts. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Charlie. Yeah. Your son. Yes. Perfect pronunciation of my name. Thank you. Um, do you equate building a mosque with, with, you define that as a charitable activity? At the organization, yes, that is considered a charitable activity. Giving people a clean and safe place to pray? Yes. Okay. No. Uh, mosques are also uh, sort of schools, too. Yeah, aren't they? especially yeah. in the underdeveloped world. Uh, for people to assemble, and, uh, yes. uh, sometimes. Uh, a man or woman uh, will want to pray by themselves, and the mosque would generally be open uh, in, in uh, uh, communities so they could go uh, be quiet there. For a while. You're very right about that. Actually, thank you for bringing that up. Mosques here, they don't because we have clean places to go home to, but a lot of the time in undeveloped worlds, um, mosques, they have, multi they have multiple purposes. So they serve as places to pray, of course. Um, they serve to places of safety, like we had just mentioned. Um, so they have many, many different uses. And so. maybe to wash one's feet. <laughs> that too, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Yes, Joe. Um, with respect to the health care aid that you provide, yes. uh, do you perform procedures, uh, preferred procedures, uh, that are in accordance with the principle of this law? Or do you avoid those which are not in accord with the principles of Could you give me an example of what you're thinking of specifically? Uh, abortion, for example. Abortion. Well, we've actually never had that issue. No one has ever come into our office saying, I need an abortion. Um, you know, as far as overseas, that, you know, you have to keep in mind um, a lot of the, the cultural implications of these countries, too. Most women are not going to, in Muslim countries, are not going to go to a doctor if they have any abortion. That's not going to happen. But what about uh, female circumcision? Female circumcision? We're totally against that. We don't do that. No. Not at all. All right. Mark. How about birth control? Birth control? Well, as far as our office is here, we don't do that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, birth control is something that there's mixed opinions about it. Contraception. There's mixed opinions about it. I mean, personally, I take the opinion that birth control is okay. Um, there are some Muslim communities, um, though am I new, that believe that um, oral contraceptives are totally, um, they're, they're unlawful. So it really depends on, you know, I, I think it's important to mention that, because um, I feel like a lot of the questions I'm getting, I, a lot of times Muslims are put into a mass group. 
we come from many different parts of the world. We come from many different cultures. You know, I'm East African, you know. So I'm Muslim first and foremost, but I also have the cultural customs of an East African and an American being here, you know. So a lot of the way you view the world or the way you view your life has to do with your culture as well, you know. And that's a mix of Islam and where you come from. Do you understand what I'm saying? You know. So I mean, like I said, there are many Muslims who don't believe in contraceptives, but there are many who do. Oh, okay. So, so none of your clinics then provide contraception or any kind of birth control things um, as a general thing, or in areas where it's more accepted by the people who live there for whatever reason that it's or or not sanctioned by the people who live there. You, you would provide contraception? Yeah, you know, and I think it's also important for me to say too, you know, in a lot of the countries that we work in, especially the ones we do emergent care in, I'll be very honest with you, the least of their worries is birth control. <laughs> no, what? Antibiotics. Yeah. They're, I mean, we, you'd be surprised how many of these hospitals request antibiotics or money to buy basic penicillins and things like that, mm -hmm. you know? So we really haven't had an issue of Contraception. You know, women requesting oral contraceptives or birth control, anything like that. I'm sure you know that's something that'll probably come up eventually. But it's more emergent medications and things like that that we're getting requests for. Okay. All right. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, is there any particular uh, school of uh, Islam uh, that uh, is particularly supportive of your uh, We're from everywhere. Even us who work at, we're from everywhere. We all have different ideas and methodologies, I promise you. Even those of us who work in the office. We're all different backgrounds. We have Palestinians, we have black folks, we have some Spanish people. I mean, it's it's everywhere. So. Yes. Uh, Charlie? Yeah, I Is that right? I'm not terribly Are well you? versed on no, this I topic, but um, most of my organizations came under some scrutiny. Mm -hmm. By the United States government. Yes. Do you have any candid statements on what went on, or as far as what organizations being scrutinized? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know what the organizations exactly happened. Or, you know, mm -hmm. As I say, is that gone away, or was that going on here, or? I mean, you know. Being Muslim in this country, even if you're not an organization or working with an organization, being Muslim in this country, you're always under scrutiny, you know, especially if you work with certain organizations and things like that. Um, you know, like I had mentioned earlier, it's a CAD foundation. We are nonprofit status. Um, we are the Smart Charity Navigator. We are very transparent, purposely for this reason, because, you know, a lot of organizations are under scrutiny. Everything is open books with us. Um, you know, as far as organizations being scrutinized, you know, I'm sure it still happens. I don't work with any that are under scrutiny, to be honest with you, or really affiliate myself with them. Um, you know, so I really wouldn't have very much to say because I don't have a lot of experience dealing with them. And I mean, back in the day when you know 2001 happened, I was still in high school, so I wasn't I wasn't working with any organizations because that was when a lot of scrutiny happened and a lot of organizations were actually shut down. Um, you know, but I wasn't working with any organizations at that time. Yeah. Bob Lichtenberg. Um, it's kind of a related question, but um, what's the uh, status of the sect of Islam known as Black Muslims, who are pretty prevalent on the far south side of Chicago, especially you know as um, preached by Louis Farrakhan? What, what, what is their standing within Islam? How are they recognized? Well, you know, they're a branch of the Nation of Islam. Uh, they're Elijah Muhammad's followers, which I know you're probably aware of. Yeah. But Farrakhan is now leading them. Um, they are recognized by, like I said earlier, they are recognized by some Muslims. Um, their methodology has changed, though, throughout the years because they were very radical back in the days um, as far as, you know, preaching a lot of hate against white men, against the white man, and things like that. Um, that's not so prevalent now. They've actually changed a lot of their ideas. Uh, you know, so they've evolved a lot. Um, we don't do a lot of work with them. They're kind of their own community, uh, but they do have good time. <laughs> uh, oh, Joe, and then Tim. Uh, after aid is given to uh, a non-Muslim group, uh, 
Is there a residual yes. thing to Islam, or is Islam promoted among the recipients, as in many other religious organizations no. that provide charity? No. We are very universal in our approach to charity. I mean, as far as the aid that we get here, the community center I work in, the people who come in, none of them are Muslim. None of those kids are Muslim. Those adults who come in who need food for their families, no one's Muslim. You know, um, the idea is not, let me give you a food package, are you going to convert to Islam? No, we don't do that at all. You know, if you inquire, if you're Learn interested, something. I'll take you somewhere if you want to go. But, you know, I, I'm not, we don't push those ideas or our own methodology onto people. The idea of the organization is to serve, not to convert. Okay. Um, can you give us a little bit of a background on the mosque where you attend and have you ever been to the one in Villa Park? The one in Villa Park. Um, Islamic Foundation? I think so. I went there once with a friend of mine from work okay. just to see Friday prayers happen and I was welcomed as yeah. a guest. You know, I went there once. I'm not part of that community. They are Muslim. I'm, mm -hmm. I've went there once, but I'm not part of that community. Um, so the mosque that I attend, I'm a butterfly. I'm a Gemini, so I'm all over the place. Okay. I go to a ton of different mosques. Um, so. You know, the one thing with a lot of Muslims is that we're, it's not like a church where you go to one specific church. Mm -hmm. Mosques are open places. I could walk into a mosque tonight and be like, listen, I'm praying here. And everybody be like, okay. You know, it's not, it's not the idea of going to one specific place. Um, so I go to many different mosques. It's usually based, I'm all over Chicago, so it's wherever I'm at, where's the closest mosque. Mm -hmm. uh, so, did I answer your question? Yeah, you did, because one of the reasons I ask is I, I'm very connected with the Baptist Church in, okay. in Huntley, Illinois, and, okay. you know, they, they've done a lot of similar charity work and things like this, yeah. and, you know, it's just the idea you get together, you have a community of people, and you, the church, too, is open as well, and yeah. we're just trying to make a little comparison to it is all, and yeah. the reason I asked about Villa Park is it was one that, when I went there, I felt very welcome that. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, From what I've heard, it's a very nice mosque. Mosque, but it's too far from where I live. So. Uh. <coughs> <coughs> All right. Ryan. Um, so you were mentioning how when no, you no. give food and like do well, good please. material deeds, it's not here, now become a Muslim. You know, it's just if they want to ask a question. So um, is that just in regards to those situations where you're transferring like material goods? Or, like, I shared a cab with a Muslim driver, mm -hmm. and I did start, you know, asking him questions, and then he went off and just poured his heart out full of, like, all the beauty of God that he sees, you know? And I learned a lot, but um, I was wondering, do, is it some, is it like a tenant that you always, you know, wait to be asked, or does anyone just, like, um, reach out and start talking, like, Christian evangelists? Well, I mean, just like, like I said, there's many groups of Muslims, you know, just like there's missionaries. Okay, so you some know, There's Muslims some who, not at our organization, but there are Muslims who go out and, you know, we call it dawah, who just spread the word of Islam. That's their oh. primary job. Um, you know, and there are some people who will just, you know, wait for a question to be asked. People always ask me questions, because yeah. it's very visible that I'm a Muslim woman. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, it all depends, really, but, you know, there's no tenant stating that you have you have okay. to wait to be asked a question. Thanks. It's all based on personality, individual. Yeah. If you feel like being out there, that's a good message because you're right. Uh, we do lump Muslims together. Thank you. And the other thing as well is, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about Islam. So mm -hmm. some people, when they're asked questions, they feel like, okay, this is the opportunity for me to explain myself or you know put myself in a more positive light. Okay, Dan, Dan Weinberg. Uh, I see by the map you're in uh, Syria, Turkey, India, China, Ethiopia, Sudan, Egypt, Libya. I mean, it seems like you're not in Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, um, <laughs> places where there are wars, nobody wants to be in, for sure. Uh, Syria? I'm not sure if it's that no one wants to be there. You know, I think it's the political climate of these countries. Sometimes it's very difficult to get in. I'll give you an example okay. before you ask your question. Okay. We do a lot of work in Syria. There's a lot of kids who have lost both parents, a lot of orphans, you know. And um, 
you know, due to the political climate of the country and because people are moving around so much, our work has unfortunately been limited to a certain extent. So based on the political climate of the country, the gov how, in how involved you can be by the, according to the government, those play a big factor. So how long have you been in Syria? We've been in Syria, oh my gosh, two years, I think now? Oh, that's all. Awesome. A little bit over two years, maybe? So since the war started? Yeah. yeah. Uh. Since the war started. I haven't seen your map, but is, would it include uh, Palestine? We do work in Palestine, yes. We do work there. She put them back in well, you're asking me a political question now, and I'm going to have to take a political opinion, which I don't want to do. Right. <laughs> I have to be neutral. You're in Yemen, Lebanon, right? Right on the border. You're surrounding an uh, area that is called Israel. Sorry, I said the word. It's also Palestinians. I mean, so you're not in Israel. You're no, we do work in Gaza. We do work in Gaza. We do a lot of work in Gaza. Okay. Yes. But you're probably not allowed by the Israeli government to be in Israel. Is that correct? Well, that's not necessarily true. Well, you just don't want to be there. That's, How about that? I, that's the question you have to talk to our director about. Okay. But uh, I just want to end it with, we do, we do work in Gaza, though. Uh, okay. Uh, regarding the... Uh, uh, upper part of... Well, that was part of Syria. Um, oh, the Golan? The Golan. No, the Go no not the Golan. Um, uh, anyway, that's okay. Thank you. We can talk more afterwards if you have more questions. Yeah, okay. uh, you include uh, uh, Shia, uh, Sufi, and uh, Sunni. Yes, almost Muslims. All Muslims. All right. Uh, yes, Cubs or Sox fan? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Cubs, Cubs. All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Charles? Um, what is Islamic law? When you guys get done, let me know. Um. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, one fool at a time there. I'll wait. And let us know when you're done, Dave, so we can. No, have... so I'm talking to you. Well, I uh, have the answer for you. Yeah. Okay. You want to talk to me some more? Yeah. <laughs> quiet. Tell him. Can we ask I'm you? Quiet. 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 Um, two point five percent. It's commendable. Mm -hmm. Now, the Christians, from what I understand, give 10%. Not all. That's a lot of money. That, if you're going to be charitable, I mean, honest with you, isn't that, isn't that kind of like on the low end? <laughs> <laughs> it's not very good. You know, the thing is, and you know, I, this is actually the first time maybe you can educate me here. Um, Ten percent, they do Christians give that every year. How does that work? Well, Not these people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm just curious, because that's a lot of money if you it's ask me. It's called tithing. It's called, it's called tithing and a lot of Christians. Not a lot. Uh, not, not a lot, but you know, the the, the goal is to a put 10% of your income <laughs> okay. into your local church. and. Well, if that was, if every Christian was doing that, our churches would be enormous and big right. and huge and serving. But, but it's a, it's only lie. It's a voluntary it's thing. Not a lot of people bullshit. I know personally do okay. do ten percent. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's not something that's mandated. No. Um, for some, it from is. what well, my like for, for, for some, it's, 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 it's on the. No, two point five percent is mandated. It is it is a pillar of our faith. Mm -hmm. You have to give it. There are no questions asked. How did they arrive at 2.5? Yeah. It's all based on a lot of things, based on income, things like that. I mean, it fluctuates and changes, but 2.5 is the set amount right now. And <coughs> since I can remember, since I've been giving it, actually, I don't have to give because I'm considered dependent under my father. But 2.5% um, is the base at this point. So, I mean, it changes on, based on a lot of things, based on the economy, how much people are making, like I said earlier. All right. Well, Joe again. Point of order. Uh, the, uh, Arab uh, community is the one that invented mathematics mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, current era, so that it was a, a, 
a really great invention to do percentage of income. And it meant not only the monetary income, because mon there were monetary uh, uh, policies at the time, but also in kind giving of two and a half percent. Yes. And keep in mind also this is for people who have had money sitting in a bank account for more than a year and has not been touched. I mean there's certain regulations. It's not just like, hey, you gotta give two point five percent of everything and I'm sitting here struggling trying to buy groceries. No. It's not like that at all. I mean, it, there are regulations when it comes to this, and there's regulations about who can receive it. So it's not just, you know, giving out money and dishing it out. Okay. You know, so. Who determines most of the governing authority for regulations in the Muslim faith? Yeah. It depends on who, what community you follow. Yeah. Um, for instance, communities who follow Saudi, you know, that's, they're, a big, they're a big issuer of fatwas and regulations and rulings and all that stuff. So, like I said, there's so many different sub-communities. Mm -hmm. There are certain things in Islam where there are just general rules for. How to pray, things like that, how to get zakat, all that stuff. Our pillars of Islam, those are basic things. And then it comes to smaller, minute things, mm -hmm. where you follow your community leaders, or back to what country they originate from, what they go with. Sort of like the difference between the Protestants and Catholics to a certain degree. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Um, like the mm -hmm. prohibition for eating meat in the Catholic Church yeah. versus no regulations in the... Yeah, and I mean the essential ba the essential fundamentals are the same, mm -hmm. right? It's just the other smaller things that are slightly different. However, the, there may be uh, a little more pressure in one community than another. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, uh, Li Ping. Yeah. Uh, since you you are working in so many uh, Muslim countries and. Uh, uh, just uh, this couple of days, uh, there are news that uh, say American embassies are closing down or uh, travelers, uh, U.S. travelers are get warnings they uh, may be in danger in this couple of days. Uh, uh, how about your volunteer, your workers? Uh, are they or U.S. citizenship or maybe not? Or are you advertised as a U.S. organization? Most of our organization, most of our partner organizations or our offices overseas, for instance in Ghana, they're run, it's the CAT Foundation, it's affiliated with the U.S., but it is strictly run by Ghanaians, people who are local from the area. Again, that's the concept, like I said earlier, you know, giving people work, our sustainability. We don't want to employ our workers from here and send them to the We want to employ people who know their own communities, you know, who work there. So they're from those regions. So, I mean, they haven't been affected by anything, any of those things, but it's known that we're an American organization, you know. So. You have a question in the back there? Oh, all right. Okay. Yes. Has yeah. your organization ever been a victim of a terrorist attack or anything uh, uh, along those lines? I'm just re referring mm -hmm. to because, yes. you know, I know there's a lot of violence in, in some of these countries. Yes. Has your organization ever been a victim of a car bombing terrorist attack or, or something along those lines? Overseas, no. Overseas, no. We haven't. I mean, here in the U.S., you'd be surprised how much hate mail we get from people and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, who assume that we're only helping Muslims Good or Christians. all that stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. uh, it's all right. interesting. Boy. Yeah. How, how old is this organization? We've been around since 2001. So we're fairly, when it comes to nonprofits, we're fairly new. And uh, a, a number of organizations are uh, um, rated by their the, uh, the proportion of uh, their income that goes uh, to uh, uh, the uh, recipients of the uh, charity. Uh, is your organization so rated? Mm, on Charity Navigator, we are. Yeah. Charity, to have that status, you have to be rated like that. Yes, so we're we're, we're four star here. The best is five. All right, that's yeah. pretty good. So we're four. Right. All right. Uh, and feel free to look us up if you want. Uh, let's see. Weinberg. Okay. Uh, when does Ramadan end? Ramadan ends. Let me see. And I still haven't broken my fast. Um, Ramadan ends in about four days. Four days. Yes. So what is Mubarak? Eid? Eid Mubarak? Eid Mubarak? Yes. What is that? That's like the, kind of like what we say, similar to Merry Christmas. Uh, Happy Eid. Mm -hmm. So Eid Mubarak. Same, is that the same name as the ex-president of 
Egypt? Yes. Mubarak? Mubarak was his last name, yes. The same word? No, not the same. I mean, the same word, but his name wasn't E. Mubarak. His name wasn't Merry Christmas. <laughs> All right. Uh, all right, Joe, Mayor. And How does Zakat learn about the communities that are in need of aid that you want to provide the aid? Well, you know, actually, a lot of the communities, they reach out to us. Our, our Ghana, and we have a huge office in Ghana, and I can testify to that because I was there for a month. We have a huge office in Ghana, and uh, the brother who reached out to us is a pharmacist in Ghana. He's like, listen, I'm from a community that is in need. And, you know, I will work at the office. I will run this stuff. Just help me. And that's actually how our Ghana office started in 2000, in, shortly after our organization started. So, you know, a lot of these communities, they reach out to us. And, of course, you know, our director and our COO, you know, they're well aware of, you know, the countries that need help. And they're very active in making sure that we deliver those needs. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lichtenberg. Uh, is the um, person's position in the uh, afterlife connected to their giving? And um, second question, um, what is the Islamic view of the afterlife? Is it eternal happiness and paradise? Bodily, physical, some kind of materialistic existence after death? Material existence after death. Physical. Wow, you're trying to, you're pushing me with the hard questions here. This is not even related to the organization. <laughs> so I have to give my own personal well, what opinion. About giving I mean, as far as giving, I mean, you, you know, it, then the afterlife. well, you're, according to us, your status in the afterlife, afterlife is based on numerous things. Um, I'm not God, so I can't go into deep. I mean, I don't know. Okay. I just know that all of us, we try our best. Um, I mean, it's based on being good to people. It's based on service. It's based on praying. It's based on being modest. I mean, it's based on many, many different things. Um, but zakat and giving to the needy and poor is a huge component in uh, what we consider our afterlife and where we'll be. So, you know, we try to do good deeds and we try to give money to the poor and those who are in need, hoping that that will alleviate us, you know, on the Day of Judgment and things like that. Okay, thank you. And, uh, but do um, you know what the um, Islamic view of the afterlife is? You well, we believe in heaven and hell just like Christians. We believe in both of those. Did that answer your question? Well, or do you want me to go more into detail? Yeah, a little more detail. I'd appreciate it. I knew that. Yeah. I mean, we believe in heaven and hell. You know, you're judged for what you do in this life, and you either suffer the cons consequences in the next or reap the benefits. Is it physical or spiritual? Is physical it spiritual. or bodies? St. Paul said it was bodies. A lot of Christians think it's souls. Well, we believe in souls. We call it ruh. It's ruh. The, word, the word is ruh in Arabic. We believe in souls. in Hebrew. Yeah, same thing. And it was here for like physical or spiritual. Physical or spiritual. Spirit. Yeah. Spirit. That I would not know. Wind. Once exactly. I get over there, I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Charles is the next person. Christian body. What are you saying? St. Paul. Read St. Paul. Where'd you take that up? Second Corinthians, the second epistle to the it's Corinthians. It's a new It talks yeah. about the resurrection of the body, the spiritual body, but it is a body. To say, huh. oh, read the second epistle, the second epistle to the Corinthians. Stone the stone. Stone. Oh, okay. I almost didn't bring it out. Oh, yeah. wow. okay. I, well, that's not my question. My question is, if you. Uh, Sadakwa Daria yes. uh, is defined as a perpetual charity, mm -hmm. which you receive reward for the life of the project. But then again, why would I contribute? I was just curious. So if you ask me for a loan for five bucks, I'd turn you down because I would prefer to give to perpetual charity. What? Charity is charity, man. Charity is charity, but remember what I said earlier in reference to the Well Project and how, as Muslims, we view, like, for, for instance, I had said my parents, our, our parents, you know, it is your responsibility, and I'm not speaking on an individual level at this point. I'm speaking general for Muslims here. Um, it, it is your responsibility as a child of a parent who passes to do good things in their name, right? So we have a lot of people who will dig wells because that is not a one-time gift. That is a gift that gives over and well, over again. Why is there a distinction in gifts? 
Well, it's a distinction it gives because you want to, I would want, for instance, my father just passed, right? I would want to give something, you know, that would give over and over and over and over again. Something that is long-term and that's sustainable. I think if five bucks to the guy standing outside, I mean, I, I would give reward for that, don't get me wrong. And my intention would be to give it on my father's behalf. But, you know, it's more of, of a, it's more of an individual thing. I want to give something that will be there, that will be sustainable. You know, with a lot of these nonprofits, and I'm kind of branching off now, but with a lot of these nonprofits, you know, the concept of sustainability is so important. You can give a one-time gift. We give one-time gifts all the time. Because I know you guys were helping people here in Chicago with electric bills. Yes. That's not a long-term. But that's important, too. So it's all based on why are you giving the gift. I mean, why is someone giving the gift? You know, so based on the reasons for giving, we would determine or we would help you figure out which, which you know, which category you want to give the, the money to. You know? So, and again, money, you know, money is important to us. You know, we're an organization and we need the money for the funds. But service, you'd be surprised. Sometimes we benefit more from people just coming in and volunteering at our organization. Or wanting to go, a doctor wanting to go overseas and help administer antibiotics to patients. You know, so charity can come in many different forms. Money is just one. Mr. Schwein. Um, when you were setting up this organization in 2001, did you get any extra scrutiny from like the IRS or uh, uh, other government organizations? Were they, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like we've heard about the Tea Party complaining that yes. you know, they were looking into them? Or, yeah. Do you feel any discrimination, let's say? Um, you know, I wasn't at the organization okay. in 2001, but you know, based on the political climate of the U.S. at the time, I'm sure that there were issues, you know, which is why the founder of the organization and our director was very adamant about making sure that everything was, like I said earlier, open books. Anybody can come into the organization and be like, listen, I want to know what you guys are doing here, who you guys are working with, this and that and this. And we'll have that all open for them. Um, now at the organization, I, personally, I, I don't feel discriminated against. Um, I haven't had any issues being there or anything like that. Um, you know, of course, there are people sometimes who call the organization who ask certain questions and, you know, who are rude and, you know, say vulgarities and things like that. But, hey, you know, you're going to have that no matter what you do. So. Hey, John. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. What? <coughs> are all or most of the countries overseas that you help, are they... Most, um, they, I think they seemed like they were all countries that were predominantly Muslim. Is that true? Most of them, yes. Yeah. Would you go to a country that's predominantly Christian? Or we would. Yeah. We would. But, you know, you're, a lot more, of these countries but you're probably more welcome in the country. Yeah, I mean, that, well, I that too. You know, yeah, in a lot of these countries, for instance, like Syria, there's a, little, there's a huge Syrian Christian community, uh -huh. you know, which a lot of people forget about. Right, no, mm -hmm. no I know that. So, but, I mean, let's say... I mean, I, there probably aren't too many places where there aren't Muslims. I mean, there's so many Muslims. Yeah. But let's say, would you go to an Eastern European country, which would probably be predominantly Christian? If there was a crisis and there was yeah. a need, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, we think. Yeah, so you mentioned that uh, you don't send lots of people from here to uh -huh. those countries. Uh, uh, to so work, to work, but to volunteer, work. yes. Out of all, all to volunteer, yes. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. We have many so, volunteers. Okay, so you did uh, provide service in both uh, manpower and uh, monetary. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <coughs> hey, uh, Don. Um, I'm not sure right away for the lecture, but I was curious. What does the Zakat Foundation of America, does the Zakat Foundation of America take a position on what's going on in Syria right now? And what, how do you all feel about As an organization, we have to remain very neutral. Yeah. We have to remain very neutral when it comes to you know political opinions. We're just there to help. We're there to help. Who's sick? Who needs stuff? Let us get it done. That's our motto with the organization. We're not there to create, you know, have any political opinions or anything like that. Okay. What does the word zakat mean? Well, zakat, you know, I mean, it comes from the, the root is to give. You know, I mean, there's numerous roots, but one of the roots is to give. Um, you know, to give to the needy, like I said earlier. Is that an Arabic word? It's a cat. Yes, it is. Okay. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, the other word was. It's to give was, alms. Sadaka. Pretty much, it's just a fancy word for alms. Alms. Oh. So, is alms. Okay. All right. Like. 
tzedakah in Hebrew. <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's all the same root. Yeah, I mean, it's all the same root. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, is there anything you have to follow up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just mentioned that there are lots of volunteers from U.S. to there. Are those uh, volunteers maybe in risk uh, because of some, some uh, anti U.S. Uh, activities? Well, you know, I mean, it depends on where they're going. Um, you know, for instance, our work in Syria and things like that, um, most of that manpower is people who are from the region, the majority of that. Um, we do have some doctors and some medical people who go over to take care of the medical needs. Um, right, at this moment, it hasn't posed as a risk. I mean, we try to keep most of our volunteers in very safe environments. Uh, you know, and most of them, they know, about, they know the climate before even getting there. You know, so they know what precautions they need to take. We've never really had any issues with anyone getting hurt or anything like that. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Is that your supper over there? Yes, there's my supper. It's getting cold. I know. <laughs> oh, well. Let's uh, get to uh, Maybe we should uh, move on to our rebuttal period, and you can sum up. Uh, if you listen to all our rebuttals, you can uh, sum up uh, all our ignorance and, uh, and uh, whatever enlightenment you have to disperse uh, upon our ignorance, okay? And feel free uh, not to comment on things you don't want to. <laughs> all right. Now, how many here have uh, rebuttals or remarks to make to the rest of us? Uh, all right, Andy and Mike and Jean and Margaret and Frank and Charlie and usual suspects. Yeah. Yeah. All right, you we each get at least five minutes, David. Yeah. Why don't we go six, six uh, or seven? All right, we have the usual uh, uh, chairs lined up here. Uh, however, ten of them are occupied. Uh, Okay. okay. Let's see. Beginning with with Mike Foley. I'll start if you want. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark, Mike. Yeah. You got an open mic uh, and an open yeah. camera. Tim will be keeping time. I, I'm going to be allowing. I'll keep to the five minute rule, but we'll be a little lax because we got a little more right. time. Okay. So. In the 2.5, increase it by 2.5. <laughs> Absolutely. So we've got to be charitable to Charles. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Perpetual charity. I like that. That's what it is. Called welfare. Well, All right. Now, let's see. Okay, All Mr. Right. Foley, you've got the mic, and let's hear your statement. I'm Michael Foley. <laughs> I'm glad I was here to hear this presentation tonight. I'll say to the speaker, it sounds like your organization is trying to do something decent and worthwhile in this country and in this world. A lot of times that'll get you savaged, but it is a decent and worthwhile thing to try and do something decent and worthwhile. I admire you for it, and I wish you well. I'm not going to say that the United States government is a big friend of your organization. But the United States government is doing everything it can to provide many, many people in need that your organization serves. I couldn't see the screen from where I'm sitting, but I followed along on this sheet of paperwork that was handed out. And I counted at least eight countries that's named in this sheet of paperwork where the United States government is actively dropping bombs or has soldiers at war or is bankrolling some other army to have a war someplace. Now, what it said in the beginning of this sheet of paper about how supposedly all wealth belongs to God and all that stuff, I don't believe that stuff. But I do feel that people who are wealthy, not just people who are well off, but people who are wealthy or rolling in dough, I think they should be aware that there are people in this world and in this country who are in difficult circumstances. And I'm not saying that rich people are obligated to give their money to poor people. 
But you got to realize that people got to eat every day and they got to sleep somewhere. If a guy's got a job, he can buy his own food and pay his rent someplace, even if it's a small little place for him to sleep at night. And if a guy doesn't have a job, he's going to be standing on downtown begging for money, and all these rich guys working downtown are going to have to be walking around past them. The guy's going to be getting in their way, asking for a handout. And at night, the guy might be sleeping in an alley behind some rich guy's house. So rich people ought to be aware that their life is a lot better off if they try to do something decent and worthwhile, like trying to provide employment for people in this country or in other countries. So all the panhandlers will get out of their way for no other reason. But anyway, again, I'd like to say to this woman speaking here, I'm glad I heard her presentation. I admire her and her organization for what they're trying to do, and I wish her and her organization well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Good job. So, as many of you know me already, I'm an equally opportunity disliker of any religion. <laughs> religion is uh, the scourge of humanity, and unless, yeah, um, religion have caused so much pain and now uh, whether you're Christian or Muslim or Buddhist or whatever they do some good deeds with people like her that is very good and I admire what she does and I respect her motives but the foundation of religion is to get more people into their beliefs which are in opposition to somebody else's beliefs, which is the con condition for starting a war. <laughs> Respect is not one of the things that we uh, have very much uh, in abundance in this society. We infringe of many other people's uh, uh, spaces and, and needs and so on. Um, the, the thing that I really like to convey is that there are beautiful people everywhere. And it doesn't matter what they believe, what country they live in, and, and so on and so forth. And I have a dear friend of mine that is alive and his family alive because uh, a German woman saved them from the Gestapo jeopardizing oh, their own life. So there is, there is good people everywhere. So we have to have a distinction between the motives of people when they do it for a belief in something that is a uh, creation of the imagination of, of humans that have no real meaning in the real world. And they try to use that as the foundation of their behavior. I think that that is a problem. I think that if you do good because you have it within you without expecting to go to heaven or hell, that has value too. And so I don't like to give credit to religion for the good deeds they do with that uh, punishment or reward expected if they do behave well. If you behave well because it's within you, that is very, very valuable to me. Okay, uh, thank the speaker. Uh, very interesting talk. Um, not real surprising in my view. There are a lot of uh, people, religious and otherwise, uh, that for whatever reason, usually their own values, uh, give to other people. Uh, there was a question about the 10%. Well, my guess is, I belong to the Second Unitarian Church of Chicago. We got maybe 180 members. We probably got, we go by pledge, okay? Pledge units, we probably got 100 pledge units. 
I would be stunned if more than five of those pledge units gave 10% or more of their gross income. So it's pretty, pretty uh, rare, at least, at least in my church, I think it would be uh, pretty rare. And uh, when you go, when you belong, at least my view is that when you belong to a church and you give money to your church, it's sort of like taking money from one pocket and putting in the other. Now the speaker uh, mentioned uh, a lot of foreign uh, agencies. Well, if you look at the broad perspective, that's the same way there. But the Unitarians have the Unitarian, Unitarian Universalist Service Committee that does somewhat uh, similar work. Uh, also, there's the issue of, uh, uh, Tim would say, uh, this has to do with uh, your uh, self-interest. We welcome people at the Second Unitarian Church of Chicago. We would like some more members. So yes, we're cordial. And we also have something called pledge sharing, where if you put money, not pledge money, pledge money is one thing, but if you come to my church and you throw in five bucks into the uh, basket, half of that money is given to a uh, special charity every uh, month. We found out we can make more money that way. <laughs> so, so there's uh, self-interest is a concept that I think uh, uh, needs a lot more thought. Thank you. Uh, in the uh, Jewish religion, there is a uh, thing called Kabbalah. One of the lessons of Kabbalah is that, uh, for example, if you, let's say you needed $5,000 very, very badly, and you exhausted every way you could to get it, and let's say you happened to walk past the bench and there was a man sitting on that bench and you got in a conversation with that man, and he said, by the way, is there anything I can do for you? And you said, yeah, you, you could let me have $5,000. And the guy said, okay, uh, it'll um, be in your bank account tomorrow morning. And if you ever need anything else, come here and see me and uh, just ask. And so you check the next day and you find you have $5,000 added to your bank account. You think to yourself, gee, I, I could have asked that guy for 50000 and he might have given it to me. So you go back there and you ask him for 50000 and he gives it to you. And uh, then you go and, and you say, by the way, is there anything I can do for you? No, nothing. And then the man, uh, you go to him another time and you say, I could use a, a new car. And you get a new car and then a new house and so forth. Where is this now, guy? One <laughs> fool at a time. Okay? Now, as I was saying, if, um, if if you ask this man, is there anything I can do for you? And he says, no, absolutely not. The fact is, eventually, you will come to resent this man. And that's what is called eating the bread of shame. This is in the Jewish religion. And so... They teach the way to not eat the bread of shame is that, and by the way, this man is representative of God. And God gives you everything you have. So to not eat the bread of shame, you should give a portion of what you have to people who need it so you can help others. And then you feel good about yourself and you never eat the bread of shame. Now, I believe one, that charity begins at home. I also believe in giving a man a hand up and not a hand out. Americans are among the most charitable, most generous people on this planet. And they give a heck of a lot. I want to say that, that um, the aim of charity ought to be to not have to give charity. 
in other words, there, there's a gentleman uh, in India, I believe it was, who came up with a thing called microfinancing for very, very poor people. They have a cow and they, they, they get milk and they sell the milk, but if they can have a second cow, they can send their son to school and he can get an education and then uh, it'll make their whole lot better and so forth. And so they do that and they get the loan, they get the cow, they pay the money back and they're better off. And this guy has done this big, bad capitalist has done phenomenal things all over the world. Well, I just want to conclude this by saying that I'm not a man to uh, not give to charity, and I think that uh, I'd like to give a few dollars now to this young lady for her charity, and that's how I'm going to conclude. I'm reminded by the religious connotations that were raised by the questions tonight of the, uh, the famous uh, song by Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Uh, from the 1970s, in which one of the lyrics reads, um, I know there ain't no heaven, but I pray there ain't no hell. Uh, from the nature of the questions that were asked tonight, it is clear that the college really needs an imam or a, an, an Islamic scholar to uh, speak to us so we can ask the questions that we need to ask about Islam, since we appear to be mostly ignorant of it. Also, um, I want to thank our speaker for uh, exposing us to the, uh, the charitable work of Zakat, uh, Inshallah. <laughs> Charity. 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 Charity does begin at home. Everybody takes care of their own. But in the United States, we're a melting pot. And we have Muslims, we have Jews, we have Christians, we have Baptists, and, uh, and many non-believers in this college also. And we, we pay taxes. And taxes are not charity. Okay. But, you know, Republicans say fewer taxes and then we can employ more people and every, make everybody richer. But uh, taxes also make roads and um, stoplights, green lights, and taxes also make hospitals and uh, schools, but charity, like the young lady said, makes schools and hospitals. So it's sort of like taxes. That's all. Like you, I am a nurse, and um, so uh, and I uh, applaud what you're doing. I think it's yes. a really excellent way of, of reaching out to your community and, and involving your community and reaching out to other people. And uh, the fact that it uh, meets huge, huge needs um, in this country as well as other places uh, makes it a very commendable thing for you to do. And, and to be done. And um, I am I'm, I'm in, in league with my husband in terms of uh, people's motivations to do things. And I do think that, that there are good people who do it and they think, well, I'll be rewarded in heaven. But they're really, or not, depending on what you're doing. 
um, but that, um, that, that in fact that's not the real motivation is that you are um, responding to the uh, needs that you see in your face and you know what to do, you have some way of dealing with them and so that's what you do. Um, so I would, um, just another uh, piece of information about wells. If you have people walking barefoot to a river in a tropical area, you are likely to get hookworm. Uh, that the hookworms are in the, in the ground and they go through your, the soles of your feet and then they infest various parts of your body, which is not a very good experience. And you eventually have anemia and are not um, able to have any energy to do anything for yourself, even if you wanted to or had the opportunity. So that's another reason to dig a well, to have safe water, but also to make the water safe to get. Um, the thing that I would uh, that I really um, want to talk about is women's health, and this is like a side thing. Um, I agree that the that you know you have hierarchies of needs. You have um, need for food. You have a need for shelter. You have a need for safety. You have a need for water. You have a need for clothing, and those are absolutely totally immediate needs that have to be met before you can do anything else. But in terms of sustainability, which is another of your concepts and, and goals, um, there, there really isn't anything that impacts women's health so dramatically as being able to space their children and to have children, to have as many children as they want, but not any more than that. <laughs> So that that's the kind of sustainable thing that is seriously sustainable and it is my sort of assumption that the reason that this is not even addressed at all seemingly in what you're doing um, is due to the fact that Islam is really a, a, a patriarchal religion and that women's needs are secondary for the most part, although there are people who do address women's needs as being primary. But the fact that, that child spacing and having, um, and being able to control the number of children that you have is just like not on the list is to me an indication that, um, that this is patriarchal. Now, you're not the only one that does that, you know that. <laughs> There's also fine Christian groups that do that too. And so, or, or don't do that. In fact, encourage the absolute opposite, that women have as many children as possible, never use birth control, and even if it's dangerous to them, to their health, to be pregnant and have children, that doesn't matter. Um, that's, um, it, it doesn't make any difference. And since women don't have any control over any of that because of the way the society is structured, they really end up dying. And, no. If you look um, here, and I'm sure many places around the world, um, if you could do that, you walk in the graveyards of uh, places on the plains, and you will find a male a guy, and he'll have four wives around him. Now, he didn't marry them at the same time. He was not a Muslim. He was Christian. But what happened is he married a woman, and then they had two or three or four children, and then she started, and then she died. Because after, after basically, the, the, the number is kind of four, like after four then you start getting much increased risk um, if there's no medical care. Actually with one there's a lot of risk if there's no medical care. The um, maternal mortality rate and, and, and infant mortality rate in Afghanistan where there is little or no health care for women is astronomical. It's, um, we have nine women die per Thousand, I think it is. And I, I, I'm not sure the number. I need to, to refresh myself with that. And in um, and if in Afghanistan, it's something like 300. So um, per thousand. Per thousand. That's what he's. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, or no, you know, I don't remember what it is, but it's truly multiple orders more than uh, certainly any, um, than actually almost any place else in the world, and that's because of the war 
also. <coughs> so places that are war-torn, places where things are not accessible, um, this kind of, of uh, health care is not available, most specifically for women. And um, at any rate, so my point is, I guess, for you to, and, and, and this is my own opinion, which has absolutely nothing to do with what you're doing, actually, or, um, uh, or uh, whatever, but at any rate, that, that, that if you really want to do something sustainable for society, you have to empower women by making it possible for them to control their fertility, to make it possible for them to have healthy pregnancies if they want children. And um, if you don't do that, there's a huge section of uh, what you're doing that's really missing. The rest of what you're doing is very admirable, but there's a huge piece that is missing. This brings me up again to an argument I've said many a time here at the College of Complexes. And that is sometimes the most charitable thing that I think has been done in the last hundred years has been the spread of globalization and capitalism. What a fucking shit. Why do I say that? Because the rules of sustainable law, the free markets have provided more jobs, more tendency to get moving for people to come themselves out of poverty than any charity program ever could. When you have free trade, when you have open markets, you have rule of law, and you have security with a stable property rights system, I believe that that probably will contribute more to the betterment of human health and lives than uh, any charity could or would. And at the same time, that same system finances charitable works for that thing. You must remember that 300 years ago, we were all peasants. 300 years ago, before the invention of capitalism and market-based economies and international trade, we were all in need of charitable works. We were all living a peasant farm existence, except for the lord of the manor, who Frankly, we all live better than that Lord of the Manor did 300 years ago. So I'm just going to simply say this. You know, I applaud a lot of the charitable work done. I do a lot of it myself through some organizations that I work with, you know, like Toastmasters and, and this place here that I put in. Very, very, very charitable. Yeah. Well, Frank, you may, you, you may discount what I do, but... There are some things that I'm involved with that... There are uh, things that you don't understand, Tim. Well, I think I understand perfectly well. Yeah. I think you're you wrong, think, to be honest think. with you myself, but... Uh, you think sorry. that you think. No, I just think you're wrong with your views yeah. about the way the world's going, and when we have, like on the 28th, and we're coming in here with a sustainable <coughs> energy future for thorium reactors, wow. and you're willing to totally discount it, I think it's kind of crazy myself, but that's another story for another day. I honestly think, though, that the most charitable thing that has been done on a societal level has been the spread of globalization, free markets, and the rise of democracy in the that's last horrendous. 50 years. But I'd also like to say thank you for coming tonight, and I really appreciate the work you're doing. We've got to be charitable, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we got time that? tonight, though. How do you get that idiot like that? By the way, um, Tim, in yeah. the Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx <coughs> and Engels, uh, one of the things, I remember the quote that Capitalism drowns in the icy waters of egotistical calculation, something like all charity. <laughs> and it eliminates all charity. You're entirely correct. But if you prefer the icy waters of egotistical calculation of free market capitalism, I don't know if you're going to get a lot of people to agree with you on that. 
It actually, no, I'm serious, he's in there, he talks about it, it gets rid of chivalrous enthusiasm, Philistine sentimentalism, and so forth. And I was trying to think of the quote, it gets rid of, it gets rid of charity, because there is no charity under free market capitalism. Um, anyhow, jumping around, be collected here. First of all, I want to thank our speaker again, for a very nice presentation and fielding some of these questions. I ran into the guy this week. Um, I was involved in establishing a charity, perhaps not on the scale of this many years ago, and I ran into the chairman of it just the other day, and we were talking about uh, what we did at the beginning and things of that nature and setting it up, and we didn't have any money and things of that nature. Um, anyhow, uh, Regarding capitalist microfinancing, uh, one of the things I did, I also have been involved in this thing at work where people contribute, but I, one thing I have learned over the years is that charitable people are charitable. Meaning in the sense that if you go to someone and say, well, would you like to contribute to this or that? And if they tell you, oh no, well I contribute at my church, or things like that, they're not really, people's personalities are consistent. So that if you're an easy mark, so to speak, but charitable people are charitable. They don't turn on and off, depending on the circumstances. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, regarding bodies going to heaven, I guess you're getting into the book of Revelations, right, St. Paul, right, who was, he wrote a book because he heard voices emanating from the cracks in the ceiling of the cave where he lived. <laughs> uh, perhaps certain branches, the Adventist churches is what they called get into this bodies flying into heaven. But the rest of the mainline Christianity, I don't think it adheres to that. So, um, another thing regarding we're on the religious theme here, I think you were, we're talking a little bit about there, and I was surprised to hear this, but in Christianity it's called indulgences meaning your acts of goodness, and you can correct me later, Reverend, uh, will somehow be rewarded later. And I think you were hitting on that. It's kind of a trade-off that you're, you're getting uh, recognition, if I may put it in that fashion, uh, in the next life. Uh, the other thing about charity is even, I, I was thinking about this too, that if charity is one of the pillars of Islam, how did you end up, how did we end up with the great moguls? I mean, these people were unquestionably in the history of mankind, the wealthiest individuals who ever inhabited the planet. And they certainly were devout to their faith, but they didn't seem by any means whatsoever to practice charity. Maybe they did. Uh, let's see, the other thing is um, putting in churches, I don't, I have a little bit, and I asked you about this, I have a little bit of a hard time defining that as a charity. And I know the religions do this, they, they build churches, it seems to be what they're preoccupied with particularly the Jehovah Witnesses of late putting up large edifices in, in prominent locations. Uh, I think you had to distinguish that from your other, certainly charitable works of unquestionable merit. Um, let's see what else. Uh, there was another project here, I guess, I found it rather unusual, so when I, I didn't send you the email but um, they had a project that they were giving uh, sewing machines uh, to women. I guess they gave away 40 sewing machines. And in reading that, I kept remarking on how 
sewing is not an activity that uh, is pursued very much, I don't think, among women in, in the United States. But they were very much pleased to each receive a sewing machine, and it was going to change their lives. I was hoping they weren't going to use it in some capitalist enterprise. <laughs> the last thing I'd like to talk about that struck me about this, however, is the fact that you're putting in wells and clean drinking water is something we kind of take for granted. We're going to have a speaker here from the Water Reclamation District. And I can't say that I've traveled in the third world, but I couldn't help wonder what sort of living conditions do people have that they really think a community improvement is having well water. These are things like, even in farms and things like that are, are commonly found I remember in the farm, the, you know, well and pumps and things like that go back in our pioneer days and things of that nature. And yet here we are in the 21st century and communities, this is a big achievement. Um, really, we've got to do something to try to equate. I'm sorry capitalism brought this about, hasn't done its job yet. And something's gone wrong here. This isn't right, that we're even putting, I mean, you're putting up a hundred wells, you probably could put thousands, I guess. Uh, what have we done wrong in not being able to have an equitable distribution of wealth and resources that people don't have such a basic thing as a well? I, I from our, from my perspective, this is something, you know, like, a, why didn't they have it 10 years ago or 100 years ago? But nevertheless, we have to think about that. But thank you very much and for the pens and the presentation. I really appreciate it. Uh, the uh, tilapia. Oh, and I also have soup and salad. Yes. Andy, capitalism have given us a lot of plastic shit. <laughs> yeah. It's also right. given us right. plastic right. shit. Plastic That's what it gives China. you. It's also given no us a lot of Andy Anderson. Andy, no, I mean, he's talking about something else. He's talking about something else. No, no he's, not, he's not referring no, no, to no, something else. He's talking about cheap stuff that, uh, you know, breaks and, you know, cheap toys that you buy over and over again. All that stuff goes into the sea. He's not talking about your, your stuff. Or plastic bags. Yeah, For those of you that may not know me, maybe there's a couple here that uh, have never been to one of my talks, but uh, as a hobby, I translate books. And to take not from German or Japanese to English, but um, take five or ten books on a subject, a database, and translate it into That's a, sure. you know, a one-page summary or cliff notes that somebody can read. Because nobody has time to read 20 books a week. And there's a vast amount of knowledge that we've hinted at here today uh, from some of the comments. There's a huge amount of knowledge out there that would be beneficial to humanity if more people knew about it. Uh, the, in the United States, the press runs coordinated blackouts on things that would improve our lives and change things overnight. Um, right now, knowledge moves forward in the direction of truth. And at, at one point in history, many people thought the earth was flat. And a little bit after that, people thought that the earth was the center of the universe. And then Galileo published his theories, which was based on uh, scientific reality that the earth revolves around the sun. But the church didn't want to hear it and he got arrested. Uh, all new knowledge, if it threatens some corporation or some government or the profits yeah, of uh, some... Shit. Huh? Like thorium shit. Frank, well, just... we'll have a, we should have a wild discussion on the debates of uh, modern energy that won't pollute the planet versus wasting our money on things, coal, oil, and gas that will continue. Uh, there's a huge debate going on right now in the environmental movement over how many years we have left before the damage becomes irreversible. And from what I'm seeing, 
Uh, I'll have a summary of that September 14th in my talk on uh, fracking. And we're not going to be talking so much about uh, what the president wants to approve, like the Keystone Pipeline, versus we'll be talking about solutions that other countries are implementing all over the place to solve problems. Bertrand Russell, he said, he, as a boy, I don't know many, he was an English philosopher, and he died uh, about 20 years ago, I think, even at the age of about 90. Uh, Bertrand Russell was raised in, the, in the, around 1900. There was a poem that they grew up with. And the people, you know, uh, this was uh, in you know, normal, polite society. The poem was a short little thing. It said, a dog, a wife, a walnut tree. The more you beat them, the better they be. Right. How far have we come? Uh, you know, in the 1960s in this country, we still had lynchings that were considered acceptable in some southern states. They couldn't understand why any would be, anybody would object to just lynching a person that uh, was of the wrong color. Uh, we've had a decade, uh, you know, a, a, a century of rapid change going on. Albert Einstein in the 50s said, the human race is in a race between education and extinction, and I'm not sure who is winning. <laughs> right? Any of you remember that quote? And we came through the arms race, and uh, there were some people in this country that were uh, immortalized in a famous film called Dr. Strangelove. They were encouraging our president that as long as we launch an all-out war first, we'll have 20, 30 million dead tops and we'll come out the winner in an all-out nuclear war. Uh, that, that's you know, just half a lifetime ago. The, these people that exhibited these insane views, fundamentally psychopathic insane, rose to the top and were running our government and some other countries. We're making a lot of progress. The ancient Chinese proverb is a really good one. It said, you cannot wake up a man who is pretending to be asleep. We have people in this country doing the equivalent of what, what I say is standing in a blizzard of evidence and claiming they can't see a single snowflake. Uh, the Catholic Church did this for many, many years, claiming that they had no evidence of a pedophile priest problem until the evidence became so overwhelming that they had to begin to deal with it. And on, on many of the society's problems, it's the same kind of thing. Now, in um, the, the, the core of my talk, my rebuttal here, should be, you have pointed out that charities are recognizing that we have, we have a problem in America and around the world where millions and millions of people need help, immediate help, and I applaud any charity, anybody that's working toward helping people on, you know, just at the basic level or whatever it is, people are recognizing that what are you going to do with a person that's 75 years old and is, is homeless? Do you just let them die in the gutter? Or do we, we help them individually, physically? Do we take up a collection? Uh, you know, I'm seeing route where I live in Palatine and some of the suburbs, People are, they're not asking for a lot of praise or anything else. People are just quietly helping people. Families helping families or neighbors helping neighbors. Some neighbors are helping their neighbors get more aid than they get from their family members who might have a lot more money. Uh, America is, we're in the final stages of seeing a culture of greed that's grown up over the last 40 years to a point where an owner of a company can say, I only have $20 billion in the bank. Uh, I, I can't send my kids to college and feel secure. I need another 40 or 50 billion. Mm -hmm. We've tolerated that, that psychopathic mental illness. That's not just greed. It's like a mental illness. And our country is tolerated, I think, more than any country on the planet. So um, it's time you know, to all of us look at what's happening. And it starts with education at the bottom. Now, we, we don't allow lynchings in the streets anymore. At one time we did, but we've reached the point in this country where 99% of the people will say that's wrong. I just can't have it. 
and we're going through that debate again. Now, I'd like to follow up on one thing that Margaret said because I think it's absolutely critical. Margaret was absolutely spot on. It's been a problem all over the world with societies raising women to be baby factories. Just crank out one baby after another until they're exhausted and die. Um, yeah, I've, I've told you about blacked out books in the past. In the six years that I've been coming here, I've never heard a single person mention one of the top ten subjects that's blacked out in America. That is, if you teach anything alternative. In America, young people are taught the wages of sin is pregnancy and death. That's it. If you're going to have sex, you risk pregnancy and death. You can't teach in America, in American schools, you can't teach women how to control the spacing of babies. That is to say, there's in other countries, there's a best-selling book. I don't know if any of you ever saw it. It was it came out in 1983. There's books uh, for married couples called The Joy of Sex and you know, Learn About This or That. Well, there was a book called ESO. It's called Extended Sexual Orgasm. And it teaches non-pregnancy sex. And uh, to, as I would translate that book, to summarize it, what they teach is, you know what foreplay is? Well, you do that. And you, you, you get together with your partner, you find out what feels good, you touch it until it feels good, you touch it until it feels better, and you touch it until you pass out. <laughs> and there you could go for years without inserting a penis into anything, right? And every, every single person I've talked to in the last 30 years that's got a copy of that book and digested it said, that's it for me, I'm not risking pregnancy anymore because this is way more fun for both my husband and me. And we never, no, no one has ever broached that subject here. And, and that, that's been a bestseller since 1983. It's called uh, Extended Sexual Orgasm, ESO. Look it up. But if that concept, if the concept of non-pregnancy sex were taught, we wouldn't have this problem. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be taking toxic birth control pills. You wouldn't have to worry about this and that. You, uh, people would have sex without risking pregnancy. And uh, in, the, in 1991, the updated version of that thing was published <clears throat> with a chapter on safe sex in the age of AIDS when everybody was worried about sexually transmitted diseases and stuff, especially sexually transmitted uh, HIV and AIDS, they said, if you have a new partner, well, do this for the first six months or a year. But usually people end up just saying, well, that's it for me. I'm not risking pregnancy anymore. I might have pregnancy-related sex for two times, have two children, and that's it. The rest of the time, we'll enjoy ourselves. And so uh, I would suggest if you uh, Charlie could find a, a doctor uh, psychologist that might want to talk about that for an, uh, that that would be an eye-opening subject here to have at the college <laughs> for one night about uh, what people can do when they when they get tired of trying to insert a half-used penis into Please something have this so penis. huh you said this penis doctor. <laughs> but, you know, we, we all laugh, but the solution, the solution to unwanted babies has been around for a long, long time. And educated, educated people uh, that, you know, know about it, but it's not in the news in America. As far as I can tell, I've never seen any articles. It's that just the subject have, is totally blacked out. That what? book should must be read to the priests. Well, <laughs> it might be a solution. Yeah, it would be a solution they, they for something. everybody. It, it, it's, 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 a, it's one of those life, you know, it's a life-changing book along with several others. But in any way, um, Tim mentioned, um, yeah, yeah. The, was it Tim that was talking about wells and clean water, or was that Charlie? Charlie. That was Charlie. Char Charlie's absolutely correct. If who <laughs> yelled time? Uh, do, do you look at the time here tonight? Are you even uh, conscious of what's going we're, on? We're being a little more. Tim, Tim said there, there's yeah. a little leeway because we're we're going to get out of here a half an hour early anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I'll I'll finish up here. Just give me thirty seconds. The ComEd put out a report talking about the cost of solar panels. The ComEd's internal report said that 
17% of America today has access to cheaper electricity than what the utilities sell them. The price of solar has come down 85% in the last 15 years or so. And so 2015, <coughs> three, three years from now, maybe half the country is going to have access to cheaper solar. We're, we're seeing a revolution and charities can help. I know there's a couple, I can't remember which ones, but there are several charities that are helping third world countries with small uh, super efficient magnetic pumps and solar panels that will you can set up a pumping station and then, then they don't have to walk for miles to get water fresh water cool. and so there's there's a revolution in energy going on with solar and wind power but especially the cheap solar panels Correct. so uh, you know uh, if anybody wants any information come see me I've, I've got <laughs> cards on this uh, thank you Well, My name is Li Ping Yuan. Uh, a charitable charity is uh, certainly a good thing in general, but uh, I would like today. I just like to point out some uh, some some problems. Uh, I hope uh, most of the charity uh, uh, organization doesn't have those problems, but I'm sure there are many of them have problems. Why is the people think, uh, okay, if there's a, a, a disaster in Africa, people don't have food, we just, uh, uh, in the U.S., we have extra food, we just uh, purchase them, send the ship, and then give them for free and dump in the port, and then they will be happy. And uh, many lives were saved by that thing, by, by that uh, action. But uh, I think that's, a, that's a, a much simplified version of uh, what really happens. If, uh, if a country has a problem to produce uh, their own food because of whatever reason, uh, you want to fix the, 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 the system, you don't want to just uh, give them free food, then you basically destroy the whole system, destroy the whole agriculture system, okay? Uh, some farmer may grow uh, something out, but uh, if once you gave them free food, those farm farmers cannot sell anything, and then they, they, they become no income instead of a little bit income less than what they, they used to be. So, uh, and then the, all the politicians and the well connected people, they got the free food, they actually turn over and sell to other people and they, they are making big money and the, the real poor people still uh, suffer. So that's just why, uh, one case. Uh, so another, like uh, if uh, closing, if you don't ship lots of free closing to, to one area, then you destroy the, the closing industry over there. If you send medical help, medical people to one community, and uh, yeah, maybe help to a certain extent, but uh, what uh, the regular health system there probably not exist, then they should be built instead of suppress those system uh, doesn't allow them to grow. And also uh, say, I just ship money over there. Okay, then you destroy the, the, the fun, uh, financial system over there. The, the financial system becomes screwed up and the people mean, they don't want to work, they just uh, want to receive the funding from this uh, charity uh, organization. So I think uh, in this country, and probably many societies, also other country, charity becomes a huge industry. Some people's uh, job is uh, to is, is, uh, depend on this uh, charity industry, and uh, they, they make big money, so like uh, the head of the Red Cross, or they, they are, they are very uh, big money positions. 
So I think uh, there are two things good to for sustainable helping other people. One is uh, education. Ed education is always uh, the more the better. Uh, you you send people to educate the local. You also educate the teacher there, so you help to build the, the education system, and also give them information. Do whatever they they need to do. They need to know, and uh, those are not. Uh, they don't have education and the information communication doesn't have uh, much uh, negative aspect. But other charitable actions do have some uh, negative impact, uh, unless uh, there are some emergency. Okay, emergency, I, I certainly agree that uh, if it's an emergency, you get, gave them help once, not every year. If it's every year something is wrong, you are just uh, creating a society of recipient and uh, you, you try to create uh, money from the wealthy people and uh, build this industry and uh, doesn't really do anything good to the society. Uh, okay, that's uh, all I want to say today. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, today's uh, this uh, presentation. Is, um, there are edu education content and also emergency help. Those are I'm um, for that. Yeah. Yeah, we don't want to screw up anybody by being terrible now. <laughs> well, that is, as a matter of fact, Charlie, that is, a, that is a very common argument. I heard Paul Ryan say the same thing, that giving people giving people money that they haven't earned is, is going to foster a culture of dependency. Yeah. But, uh, but um, now, okay, in this, uh, I was very interested to attend this, and I'm sorry I couldn't actually hear the lecture because unfortunately my work kept me from getting here sooner. Um, but I actually have attended an event of the Zakat Foundation uh, some time ago. It was their uh, an event they had called Humanity Time at the University of Chicago. Now I'm, I don't know if some of you may know this, I'm with uh, Amnesty International with our local group here in Chicago and we had a table at that event for Amnesty. And uh, when I was at the event, I actually got to meet the director of the Zakat Foundation. I got to talk to him. He was a very interesting guy, very nice guy. Um, they're involved, and I got, and I attended the, uh, the lectures too, and they talked about, they talked about a lot of the things that they're doing. And one of the interesting things they're doing right here in Chicago, like, just the mic down. Is, okay, one of the things that they're doing right, right here in Chicago is um, uh, some members of Zakat Foundation are trying, are, um, well, I guess it's no big secret that, um, that there's a lot of violent crime in Chicago, especially in the black neighborhoods. And some of the members of the Zakat Foundation are actually trying to stop the violence, trying to get people to resolve their differences peacefully instead of through violence. So I, I think that's a good thing. And um, I think that, uh, and, and that's happening right here in Chicago. So now, now some people, some people have kind of a negative view of Islam um, because of what they've heard in the media and, and so forth and so on. They hear that it's, it's patriarchal or that it's kind of, um, that's a, some kind of aggressive warlike religion. Uh, well, as far as it being patriarchal, when I was at the Humanity Time event, I saw I saw a lot of women and girls there. In fact, I think there were more I think there were more women uh, in in the Zakat Foundation that I saw at that event than there were men. Thank you. Oh, is, right. is that been your experience as yeah. well? I mean, most of it's women at the organization. Yeah, it's, it's mainly women. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, there was a few men there, but it was mostly the director's a man, but it was yeah. mostly women. And um, so the other thing that I, um, the other thing that I noticed, um, as far as, the other thing you have to realize is that it's, it's important not to make generalizations about Muslims because there's a lot of different Muslims and you shouldn't go and assume that, that they're all like the Taliban. You know, those guys are, those, those guys are crazy. They're like, I mean, they're like the, the, the Taliban are, are almost, they're like the equivalent of, um, 
the snake of the coo- charmers. The, the what? The snake charmers. Don't no, no, I would no. say that they're more like the equivalent of the KKK yeah, or something. Yeah, I was going to say, the Ku Klux Klan calls themselves right, the Christians. Right, the Ku Klux Klan call themselves Christians. You should remember that. Yeah. And, um, and they, 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 they have their cross-lighting ceremony. And that's, that's um, and, and I don't, you, the Taliban should not be taken for, rep, as representative of all Muslims any more than, than the KKK should be taken as representative of all Christians. Uh, now, uh, I wanted to just say to Tim, uh, you were talking about free markets being the greatest form of charity ever, um, and about how globalization creates jobs. I'd have to, um, I'd have to disagree with my friend Tim about that. Um, on, uh, globalization has actually sent a lot of jobs overseas. Uh, a lot of factories here in, in this part of the country have closed down. Uh, and, and because of globalization, they've gone to China or to Mexico or wherever. And, um, and, and in terms of, global, of the free market giving us a high standard of living, well, um, that's not really the case at all. I think you could make a case that it's really unions that have given us a high standard of living yeah. much more than the free market. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I'll just, just as an example yeah. here, that, that the, the guys that run these companies really have an economic incentive to pay their employees as little as possible and um, and and to and to have the employees work on on the boss's terms uh, but just to, to run down the list of things that unions are responsible for first of all unions are responsible for us having a 40 hour work week otherwise we'd have to work as many hours as the boss says. They're also responsible for the eight hour work day. They're also responsible for the laws of overtime. They're also, unions also are responsible for the existence of unemployment compensation for when you're, when you're out of work. They also are responsible for the minimum wage. I mean, people think, and they're also responsible for OSHA. Uh, people think that's the biggest impact of the unions has been, is not so much in what they've done for their individual members, but in what they've done for the whole society. Uh, now, um, now, the, you hear an argument sometimes, that this is, I mentioned this when I first came up to the podium, uh, to the microphone, that this argument that charity causes dependency, and I heard, I heard Congressman Paul Ryan of Wisconsin say that the same thing, that, that he thinks that, that giving people money, that, you know, giving people money that they haven't earned uh, will somehow create a, a, a cycle of dependency. Well, this, um, this is this is a completely spurious argument because, you know, m most people, most people who collect this, um, who who get some kind of help from, from either whether from a, the government or from a private charity, do so only on an as-needed basis. You know, most people and and now there's another argument that you hear a lot, which is that the solution to all our problems is for everybody to go out and get a better education. Um, and I even hear this from President Obama. Uh, saying that the solution is for everybody to go out and get a college degree. No. Now, I want to ask you all a question. Now, I assume that once a person gets a college degree, they're going to expect to get the type of high-paying job that requires a college education. Now, if all 300 million of us go out and get those kinds of... Right now, only a quarter of Americans have a college degree. Now, if, if, all, if the whole 300 million of us go out and get a college degree, um, and, and we say, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm going to be a doctor or a lawyer now, and, and I'm not going to... I'm not going to I'm not going to repair air conditioning and I'm not going to I'm not going to be a plumber and I'm not going to be a waitress and I'm not going to do any of that stuff. So who's going to do that work? That work keeps the whole country going. We cannot the, the the society cannot continue without people doing that work. Somebody has to do it. And we have to recognize that those jobs are not worthless shitty jobs. But they're just as important as being a doctor or a lawyer, yeah. and I would say they're a damn sight more important than being an investment banker. Uh, the suggestion about 
that we simply uh, do what comes uh, most comfortably uh, uh, was suggested, I think, by Tony. Uh, 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 of the, uh, what was her name, the uh, Surgeon General under Clinton? Jocelyn uh, Elders. Jocelyn uh, Elders. She, she had to resign because she had been. She mentioned that in public. It, she just resigned. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, at the, that's, I'm afraid that we may not have moved too far yeah. from that uh, point of view. But uh, maybe if we keep nudging, maybe uh, the current Pope, uh, who uh, uh, isn't going to judge anybody, uh, uh, <laughs> will, uh, will not make a judgmental announcement or something, but I'm afraid that uh, uh, church doctrine is not always up to uh, the uh, public relations uh, front of, uh, of that uh, denomination of Christians. Uh, well, and uh, for that matter, we generally, uh, whatever church, uh, generally we, we uphold uh, marital relations and families, uh, in all, all in good order and decency and so on. Uh, and there's some merit to that. Uh, so, uh, let's be a little sparing in our judgment on uh, denominations as well, uh, and pray for them all. Yeah. Uh, Yes. Yeah, well, uh, at least uh, Charlie uh, was uh, prayerful enough to uh, allow us to hear from the Zakat Foundation of America, which was, I think, a, a bit more charitable than uh, Bob Matter's uh, uh, remarks about uh, uh, Islam and Muslims. Uh, well, anyway, but he is not here to defend himself. Uh, anyhow, uh, what, what shall we say? Uh, it would be behoove us all to look at our budgets and uh, be sure that we're contributing to others. Uh, some are in a better position than others to do so. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, being allowed to have four wives uh, is, becomes the, the privilege of those who have wherewith to support uh, four wives, uh, even if uh, the four wives are maybe also supporting uh, the, uh, the, their husband. Uh, the, and when uh, women are reduced to baby-making machines, it's uh, probably because uh, the uh, culture finds having babies is profitable to the family, and uh, that, however, is not always the case. In our society, uh, <coughs> charity has been taken over largely by the state, and uh, that was true in uh, medieval Europe, where the state, or the local lord, uh, said, you know, uh, you're going to have to give 10% uh, to the church, and you're going to have to pay the, your annual rent. Or, and you also might have to work uh, on uh, the local road. And uh, if we have uh, 
a war or our neighbors are trespassing upon our our lands and uh, rights, uh, you might have to go to war and be uh, conscripted into uh, the uh, local knight's uh, service. Uh, well, what can we say? Different cultures present different uh, kinds of economies and uh, different kinds of distribution systems. But uh, at least there was an acknowledgement of the, in many societies of that there were needs that had to be met and that the social order, uh, whether it was the mosque or uh, the local uh, uh, zakat uh, uh, foundation or the church uh, were involved in this. Uh, in uh, the church, uh, the uh, the widows, that is, uh, and the deacons. Uh, were the in the early church uh, in uh, our biblical uh, evidence uh, the distributors <coughs> when it comes uh, uh, to uh, to our how, how do you distribute to people whose only community is their family and their 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 uh, people of uh, their own neighborhood, and particularly uh, when their you know they, their religion is that they uh, go to mosque uh, and uh, have uh, public prayers uh, in uh, uh, en masse in uh, a. A, a publicly ordered no, uh, yeah, way. Uh, you have that there. It, it's uh, it behoves people to be able to uh, to be conscious of the needs of others, and uh, uh, somebody <coughs> has to remind us. So. I hope that uh, whether it's a mosque or a church or an atheist society, uh, yeah. uh, that uh, somebody does yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, the. Uh, uh, Marxist humanists uh, with their meeting Monday night uh, are <coughs> at least conscious that, that a, a different form of society is needed uh, for human liberation. And uh, I, I think that, uh, that uh, somebody here like, like Tony Ball and uh, Bob Stiff, uh, who are I'm missing at the moment, uh, and will be remembered, uh, but they t did go to such meetings. Where is that meeting? Uh, 228 South Wabash, uh, 6.30 p.m. Monday night. What is it? What meeting is that? What? What meeting is it? Uh, Oh, of the News and Letters group, and it's a discussion of Marx, oh. Karl Marx, oh, and his yeah. ideas. Speaker gets the last word if there's no other rebuttals. Uh, yes. Could I? Right. Just so if you no problem. Okay. All right. We still got time. <coughs> oh, that's true. This, this is just numbers. I went, went on my iPhone and got numbers. Um, maternal mortality is number of deaths per 100,000 people, per 100,000 women. 
um, and, um, and women in the childbearing ages between 15 and 45. The, t the highest infant mortality rate in 2010, and it, you also have to keep in mind that these are estimates, they're not exact, was in Chad, and it was 1,100 1, women died every year for, uh, for pregnancy and, and child-related diseases per 100,000 women um, in the childbearing uh, ages. And the United States is 21. And we're actually 136 out of the 183 countries that are, so we're, we're not even close to the uh, bottom at all. Um, Somalia is, is, was number two in maternal mortality rate, which you probably already know. You look like you know already. <laughs> it's a thousand per hundred thousand. And Ghana, Ghana is 350 women die per hundred thousand women every year. Canada is almost half of our rate. It's 12 women versus our 21. Um, they and, half of mass. <laughs> and the infant mortality rate is the number of uh, births, uh, per thousand births, the number of children under the age of one who die. The number one is Afghanistan with 119 infants per thousand who die in the first year of life. Somalia is 101 or almost 102. Ghana is 59 and the United States is 5.9 and the United States again slides in at the 174 out of the 220. Four countries who are now these are CIA statistics <laughs> people. <laughs> um, there's a number of different the World Health Organization did, did these evaluations and this so you have to kind of know that they're sort of approximate. But that um, that's the numbers. Mm. Two minutes. Okay, two minutes. I'd like to give a two minute update. Um, Who is it that said, um, talked about, um, we're, being, we're being subjected to the great education scam in this country, what many people are calling a great credit hour scam. Spend, uh, spend a couple, you know, I agree with Don. Uh, uh, our, 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 our colleges are turning out debt slaves now, where they come out of college, sure. massive debt, and no hope of getting a job. I give the country one more year. When the group graduates next year, the college graduates come out, come home to live with mom and dad or wherever they're going to live, and they have no prospect of getting a living wage job because the jobs aren't in America. The factories are overseas. So uh, the making things better starts with education. It doesn't mean a college education. It means learning what's going on around you. We, we are in a war. We're not in a war with Islam in other countries. We are in a war with predators, billionaire predators that have been waging a war on the middle class in this country since 1980. And there's no doubt about that. This, this book, Predator Nation, describes it. A lot of the money that's, we've talked about, um, you know, these numbers that Margaret just wrote. Here's a book, a brand new book called The Body Economic why austerity kills. And it describes what happens to the infant mortality rate, the suicide rate, the general death rate among the least fortunate people in a society when any government starts to cut the budget, cut social services, uh, like what's happening in America and uh, Great Britain and some other countries right now. Now Iceland is a classic case. They're spending money to try to help people so they don't become homeless or lose their health care and things. And Iceland is a glowing example of what's happening. And charities all over the world in various shapes and forms are recognizing this. So I, I, I fully applaud your organization, and especially it's overwhelmingly women, isn't it? Women make up, women are, seems like women are earlier on, they, they see these problems or just say, you know, this isn't right. Uh, it's not right to treat people like this at any level. We have to do something. If, um, I have three copies. If anybody wants to buy one, these are $18. If you want to know what's happened in America in the last decade, 
last four years really, uh, this book lists the 19 people that covered up the crime of 9-11. We haven't had any investigation in America because 19 people in high places uh, participated in, uh, smoothly in the cover-up. So the, the 19 people that they list in here, they, this is a history book of their last 40 years of government service in the CIA, the FBI, overthrowing the governments in Nicaragua, all kinds of things. And they are closely tied. Those 19 people are tied to the predator billionaires who gave us the Wall Street, the greatest bank robbery in the history of the world. So recognizing where we are is the first step toward helping our friends and neighbors you know, understand here's what I you know what we coach seventh graders. So you teach you have to correctly identify the problem in order to be able to solve it. And for the life of me, I don't know why anybody else is not telling young women you don't have to be a baby factory. You you should be able to you know that it's in this day and age, the twenty first century, I think it's obscene that women are still being forced to have babies that they don't want or can't take care of. Huh? Well, I don't think there's anybody of childbearing age, perhaps you, but everybody else here is way, way beyond worrying about it. But you all have or know people that have children and grandchildren, and uh, we can pass that knowledge on to them. That's what, what seniors normally do. They try to leave the place a little bit better than how they found it. And, and then I think that's... <clears throat> the core of, of charity, you know, try to do the best you can. If there's something you can help, you know, help out a little bit. Well, thank, thank you again for your talk tonight. It was great. <laughs> Nothing demonstrates the inherent generosity and charitable nature of the capitalist class than the fact that they are sending work over to the poor people <laughs> in other countries. Yes, yes, yes. Speaker gets the last word. Speaker gets the last word. I don't have anything really to say except thank you for having us come and talk about the organization's work. Give us your website and how somebody can contact you since okay. this is going out on the internet. All right, the website is www.zakat.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Uh, we're very active on our social media. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Close this out, Brahm. No, Brahm is going to bring Jesus. Thank you all for coming. Go in peace and come back good. As soon as you can. In the world. Yeah.